Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. This is the Little Bean and Me podcast channel. My name is Kayleen and I'm your host. And today I'm going to bring you through a little bit of my dye process. Uh, I usually get questions about um, materials that I use to dye, how I dye, what kind of pans I use, um, what kind of dyes I use. And so I'm happy to share some of that information with you and kind of take you through start to finish um, what my dye process looks like. So if you watched my live streams before, you've seen the dye process happen. Um, it's not in its completion because usually I've done some prep work beforehand. But today I'm going to bring you through some of the process and I'll show you a colorway. I'll just dye a colorway for this video so you can see how I handle my dye. And um, yeah, so First we're going to th go through the materials that I need to dye, um, how I apply them, how I use them, how I prep my yarn, and also how I keep myself safe during the dye process. So if you're interested in that, uh, just keep on watching, and I think I might just do a voiceover, so it'll be nice, clean, and crisp audio for you, and so let's just get into it. <laughs> Alright guys, so here is my kitchen so I do dye in my kitchen I usually have a setup here uh, when my kids are napping or occupied because I do not prefer them being around here uh, when I am doing my work so first I'm going to take you over here and show you the tools that I use when I'm dying first and foremost is safety so I always have my dust masks and I also wear gloves when I dye to protect my hands and my lungs I only get one set of lungs and I prefer not to inhale uh, my powder dyes. And then here I have some ties. I've pre-cut some acrylic yarn that I just have in stash to use up so I can use them to tie off my yarn pieces. Measuring spoons, some containers to apply the dye, plastic cups that are just for dyeing, citric acid, and I also have my utensils. Um, these are just for dye only. They are stored with my dye materials and do not get used for food. Now if you're using acid dyes, that's really important to note. But otherwise, um, if you're using food dyes, you could be sharing pans, technically. I still wouldn't. Um, anyway, so here are the containers. Here are my pans. So these are um, two roaster type pans that you would use for... Um, that you would use for catering. So they're just stainless steel, 100% stainless steel. They're pretty heavy duty. Uh, I didn't want to get the cheapest ones because I wanted to make sure that they would be lasting and that they were truly uh, stainless steel. Uh, and this is how I prefer to dye. I prefer to lay my skeins out in these type of pans. And I can do four skeins per pan. I could do more if I chose to, but generally I do four per pan. And then down here on the floor, is my yarn. So I have two different bases. I have my everyday sock base and also my simple sock base and then a container that I will put all of my soaked yarn in. So I'm going to be soaking my yarn in my sink and then I will place it there. And then here is my sink. Um, I will be moving my sponges and fish stuff out of the way but this is where I soak all of my yarn. Every, every skein goes into the sink for soaking and also for washing. And then I will show you where I keep my dyes. Okay, so on this side of the kitchen, you can see here I have my dye storage containers. So they're color-coded. Um, down here is some supplies. So there's no dye in here, just um, extra supplies. But these are my neutrals and browns, blues and purples, greens and blues, greens and yellows, and reds, kind of through the whole spectrum. I have extra containers for dye that is just for drying up there. Um, my spin dryer, and then this large pot is also just for dye. And then, excuse the big mess, but I've moved everything onto this table. There's my skein winder, my swift, my ball winder, and then these are the shelves that I keep my pans on. So I keep kind of everything separate in my kitchen and I try to um, segregate all of the dye things into their own section so there's some containers of dye way 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 up top where the children cannot reach and also these are closed lid boxes so the kids would have to take them out and then open them up um, to get into here but I am thinking about putting some child locks here so that they can't even pull these out without um, having a lock to press so 
Uh, yep, so that's how I keep everything. And now I'm going to get to prepping. So I have here my skeins. These are right out of the package, um, unsoaked, untouched, undyed, uh, direct from the manufacturer. So what I do is I straighten out my skein by um, finding the ties and ensuring that I have one continuous loop, that there are no twists or problems with the skein before I tie it off. I take a small tie, which right now I'm just using scrap acrylic yarn to tie off my skeins, and I just tie off each skein individually. This serves two purposes. One, it makes it really easy for me to um, get the skeins in and out of the pan without doing too much tangling, um, and then it also makes it really easy later on, in case I do have a tangle or a twist, that I can use this looping tie as kind of a guide for where my um, yarn should be. So I'm going to go through and tie off some of these, and I'll probably put a little time lapse in here so you don't have to stand and watch me um, do this for 25 minutes, but I'm going to tie off all the skeins I'm going to dye today, which is 20 skeins of Everyday Sock and 20 skeins of Simple Sock. So, here we go. So here's what the yarn looks like while it is soaking. So I just leave it in here for five or 10 minutes, making sure all the strands are saturated. Um, this is just a superwash and merino, um, superwash merino nylon blend. So I know that this will absorb water well. And um, I know that it won't take very long to soak and to be fully saturated. Now, if you're soaking other types of fibers, so if you're soaking non-superwash merino silks, or you know cottons or anything like that then your soaking time may vary but for me five to ten minutes in a soak for this this particular base is okay and the same for my singles base which is just 100% superwash merino um, it takes up water really easily so I'm just gonna let this soak here for about 10 minutes while I tie up the rest of my skeins and I will get back to you when we're ready to dye all right, so everything has been soaked and separated. So each little cluster is four skeins, which is what will go into each pan. This side has sock and this side has simple sock. Um, so four will go in one pan and four will go in the other. And I'm going to dye the same colorway on both bases. So yeah, so let's get to filling the pans. Okay, so my pans are here. I'm getting ready to fill them. Uh, for the colorway I'm gonna dye for you guys for this video, um, it's Mimbulus Mimbletonia, which I've dyed a couple of times before, but it's a two-stage colorway. The first stage is a tonal that I will be dyeing onto the yarn, and then the second stage I will be speckling it with different colors. So for the first stage, I'm going to be filling these pans up probably just below this line here and laying the skeins in. Um, and there are different techniques you can do depending on what kind of a tonal you're doing, but for me, I'm going to add the water, the citric acid, the dye, and then I'm going to lay the yarn in the pan. So, here we go.
All right, so I have the first part of the color on the skeins right now. Um, this is a green color that I know will break, and that is the intended um, use for it in this colorway particularly. So this is Mimulus Mebletonia. It is kind of a sage-ish, kind of like a bluey, like a really light bluish green that breaks a bit yellow. And then on top of it, we're going to do some speckles of um, some teal, some purple, maybe some darker kind of sage color uh, once the color is set. So what I'm going to do is let this exhaust. So right now the heat is on a medium. I'm going to bring the temperature up. It was already pretty warm to begin with. I filled the pans with warm water just to accelerate the process a little bit. Um, so let me walk you through what just happened just as a recap because you saw that as a kind of a montage, a little fast forward. So what happened was I poured the water in, I filled it up to nearly where the line is in the pan because I wanted to make sure I had enough water in there to submerge the skeins. The skeins are going in damp, so they're not going to absorb a ton, but they will add to the volume of the pan. And I put in some citric acid, so I usually do a tablespoon or two depending on how much water is in the pan. I usually pop a little extra in just in case. I can always measure it out with my pH strip, but I've been doing this for quite some time now, so you know, the measurement for me is a little bit approximate, but I know the water is acidic. Um, and then what I did was put the dye in, so I measured out, I think that was, because I don't have this recipe written down, I have to remember this recipe, which will be written down now. Um, that was about three quarters of a teaspoon of dye per pan. So for four skeins, I did three quarters of a teaspoon, which I think was the correct amount uh, because it's looking exactly like it used to look. And so I did three quarters of a teaspoon in each pan. They were already pretty warm. Uh, the heat was already on a medium to medium high just to kind of accelerate the heating process. And so when I dunked the yarn in, it was already starting to strike the bottom of the, um, the skeins, so I made sure I lined them up, submerged them in, and then I used my hands to spread them out as long as the water is not too hot. Once the water gets to almost boiling, I'm not going to stick my hands in there. That's what I have tongs for, so I'll either use my hands or my tongs to just move the yarn around, and you can see, I'm not sure how well the color will translate, but you can see that the blues uh, from the green dye are striking before the yellow, so the yellow that's in this particular dye blend is striking after. So the heat and the acid make the blue go first and then the yellow. So if I wanted to try and get a really solid kind of mid-tone sage, then I would have to start with cooler water or no acid and let the yarn absorb the dye beforehand. So this is the intent to break it, so I did. Um, so these skeins will come out very tonal with kind of sagey green, blue, with yellow, and it'll be really pretty. So this is going to set for about 20 minutes or so, depending on uh, how quickly the dye will strike. It's also going to go through a speckling process after, so I'm not worried about this fully setting yet because it will be going through more heat. Um, as the dye process moves along, but I just want to make sure that all of the dyes are exhausted into the yarn before I move to the next step because I don't like to waste dye and I don't like to dump dye down the sink. So I'm um, going to let these exhaust, remove the extra water, and then I'll bring you back for my speckling process and how I do it in just a few minutes.
All right, guys. So, I'm gonna take this off. Ouch. Um, so what you just saw happen was I checked the water, uh, making sure that it was clear, that the color had exhausted into the yarn, so there was nothing left to do but, you know, to sit and set in the water. So I reduced the water level down to just at the surface of the yarn to speckle. So the key for speckling for me is to speckle with low water, with higher heat. So I raised the heat up to medium when I started speckling. And I also use my hands to speckle. Um, there are a lot of different ways you can speckle. You can speckle using um, either the dye powder or uh, the dye liquid. Uh, I just had a nice interruption from my four and a half year old that wanted an apple, but I can't cut an apple right now because the dye is full of kitchen. The dye is full of kitchen. The kitchen is full of dye. Hello. Okay. So sorry for that little cut here, but so what you just saw was me lowering the water in the pans, using my hands to speckle the dye powder. Um, you can use different methods to speckle dye powder. You can use um, salt shakers with a fine, um, like a fine straining lid. And usually people will either put salt or citric acid into the salt shaker together. Uh, you can use a spoon, you can use a fork, you can use a paintbrush, you can use your fingers, you can use a tea strainer. Um, there are a bunch of different ways you can speckle dye powder. You can use liquid dye and just drip it onto the yarn if you want to. Uh, for me, I prefer to use my fingers, so that's what I did. And I speckled a nice teal color and a purple color, um, and also a little more of the sage color, uh, so that we'd have some nice dark uh, sagey speckles. So what's happening now is I recovered my pans and I am allowing the dyes to set and I will flip the yarn, speckle the second side, let the dyes set again, and then I will do my rinsing process. So here we go. Okay, now um, these are set, the colors are set. I'm having no bleed out onto my fingers when I touch the yarn, which means it's been sitting long enough in the heat. Um, these are right now on a four of nine, so they're on, you know, low medium heat. So I'm gonna shut the heat off here so that we'll stop bubbling and if this was a non-superwash yarn, I would wait for this yarn to cool off before I put it into the sink to wash. But because this is superwash yarn, I'm not really concerned about felting it because it won't felt. Um, and I'm going to cool it off in the sink. If it was non-superwash yarn, I would wait for it to cool. Then I would put it in a tepid to cool sink, uh, trying to get close to the temperature of the yarn if it wasn't completely room temperature. Uh, and then slowly bringing the temperature down to cool as a precaution to ensure you don't felt. So right now I'm just wiping the sides of my pan with a towel so that I get up any extra dye speckles that might be there. Um, there are some speckled bits of dye on my stove right now, but I will be cleaning that off. Um, no food contact comes to the knobs, so um, I'm not worried about contamination in that way, but I am going to clean it off later. Uh, it just goes to show you that dye does go everywhere, especially if you're speckling with dry powder dye. Whether it's food safe dye or not, it's powdered and you shouldn't inhale it and you should always wear a mask. And that's the reason why. So I'm not sure if you can see here, but there are bits and speckles of dye. So now I'm going to move my yarn over to the sink and I'm going to bring you with me here. So as you can see, I have cool water in here along with some eucalyptus soap. So I use the recommended amount of soap per gallon of water. So I have a big pump jug full of eucalyptus. Uh, it's an unscented soap that's a no rinse 
type soap where I can put the yarn in, rinse it in, wash it, and I don't have to worry about rinsing it again, which helps save water. And also there's a touch of lanolin in it, so it should help recondition the fibers as well from going through the dye process. So now I'm going to move the yarn from this pan over into the sink. So I'm using my tongs to squeeze out extra water as I lift the skeins out so that I'm not dripping all over my kitchen. moving to the sink and submerging the yarn in the water. Uh, this yarn is still hot, but again, I'm not concerned with felting because it is a super wash yarn and I'm not doing a ton of agitation either. Okay, so what you saw me doing here is I take the ties of the yarn and I loop them over my faucet so that I don't have any tangling while I wash the yarn. So. I can agitate and get all the citric acid and cool the yarn off without worrying about all of the yarn tangling up. Um, I will reuse this rinse water for a second batch of yarn if I can, um, as long as there's no bleeding into this, which there should not be any. Right now I can see that the rinse water is clear, as most of the time it is, unless it's a difficult color. And then I will also reuse the dye water. So I'll show you here the dye water. All right, as you can see here, this is the pan that I just dyed in, and you can see that the water is clear. I also wiped down the sides of the pan, as you saw, so it is ready now for more yarn. The amount of water that's in here right now is enough to do another speckled yarn. If I wanted to do a tonal and then a speckle on top, I would have to fill it again with more water. But I always try to reuse the water where I can, so I can just pick a pH test strip, test how um, acidic the water is, and if I need to, add more water and citric acid into it. Same with this pan. So I do like to reuse my dye water. Right, so here we have the final rinsed yarn and this will go into my spin dryer. I've wrung out a generous amount of water so it won't be too heavy in there and I will show you the rinse water and also the spun out yarn and how I use my spin dryer in just a moment. All right, and as you can see here, my rinse water is completely clear. So I can reuse this rinse water uh, without a problem. And if there's any issue or I feel like the yarn didn't rinse well in this, I will refill the sink to do a fresh, um, a fresh rinse or I'll run a little bit of fresh water over the yarn to make sure all the citric acid is rinsed out and there's no tackiness to the yarn. So let me show you my spin dryer. All right, here we are. Whoa. My hair is, this is what happens when you dye. You get all the steam in your hair. It's very beautiful, it's very beautiful, if I do say so. Okay, so I'm here right now with my spin dryer and I'm gonna show you how I load it up and how I start it and the whole process. You don't need a spin dryer to dry, dye yarn. I could hang the skeins as they are, let them dry out, and that would take a few days. But for me, I would either use a salad spinner uh, or I would use my spin dryer. If I didn't have electricity, I would use my salad spinner. So here it is. I use the laundry, laundry alternative mega dryer. It's huge. It holds probably 30 skeins of yarn, 32 skeins of yarn or so at the most. And um, I usually can get a few colorways in there before I have to spin it out. And it drains out of a a spigot. So here it is. Here's the dryer and you can see here there's a knob that I can turn to set my cycle. Inside it is just a centrifuge. It's a plastic bucket with my yarn at the bottom and just as you would in a washing machine I do try and 
evenly distribute the yarn so I don't have an imbalanced load. And then down here at the bottom, you can see here's my spigot, and I have an, a secondary dye pot that I use to dye small tonal lots or mini skeins, and so I use this as my catch. So if you have a drain in your floor, like in a garage or a basement, then this would be ideal, or you can just use the bottom drain spout, which if this is in, will automatically drain out of the bottom drain, but I do not. This is my kitchen. So we're going to set the timer and let it spin. So you can hear the spin dryer going. It's not very loud. It's actually pretty quiet. Uh, for the amount of revolutions it's doing and how much uh, yarn is in there. Uh, obviously no effort of my own. I just plug it in, turn it on, and it goes for me. Usually when this is happening, right now I'm filming a video, but usually when this is happening I am already putting the next dye lot into the pans and getting everything prepped, selecting my colors from my, um, my cart here, my little dye storage cart, and then, you know, just moving on from there. But for the purposes of this video, I am going to stand here and wait for this to finish. So then I can show you what it's like and how much water came out of the yarn. Um, you saw me wring it out by hand. I, I pretty much took my hand down the, the whole yarn to squeeze out as much as I could. Did a twist into the yarn. Not too much scrubbing or, you know, wringing or anything like that. Just enough to get most of the water out the, as much as I could by hand. Um, and then this dries it probably 95% of the way. I hang it onto my drying rack, which is right behind me, and I just let it die. Uh, die. <laughs> I let it dry for about, you know, 18 to 24 hours, depending on how much water is out, what our weather conditions are like. Um, obviously, when it's humid or super hot and sticky or thunderstormy or rainy, things will take a little longer to dry. But usually if it's warm or dry outside, just typical weather, it's, it's pretty much good to go within 24 hours. If there's any doubt, I just let it sit for longer because there's no point in rushing to package it or rushing to get it out because if you send a customer a meal, you'll be smelling uh, skein. They're going to be very unhappy. So I'd rather wait until everything is 100% dry and then send it out to the customer. So that's just that and I'll show you how to hang them. The spin dryer is done. It's done. Okay, so the spin dryer just finished up. You could hear it revving down. Once it's finished, I can reopen the lid and we can see the yarn inside, which is all spun out and dry. And you can see here how much water came out. There is probably a third of the pot filled with water right now. So that's quite a bit of water. Um, it would have taken a long time to dry, so I'm going to dump this into my rinse sink because this is just rinse water and hang up my skin. Okay, so here we are. We're at the end of the dye process. Ooh, it this kind of matches. So I have unloaded my spin dryer here and I have my dried yarn, well, almost dry. And so what I will do is hang each individual skein onto my drying rack. I will snap it out to make sure all the strands continue to be aligned and are not tangled. And I usually start from the top and go down because I have young children, but I hang it across two, two poles of my drying rack so that it has a chance to um, spread out and let air get in between the skeins. You certainly can hang it individually if you don't have enough room on your drying rack for everything that you're dyeing, but it will take a little longer to dry because air cannot get in between uh, the layers of the skein. So I usually hang four across on my drying rack, but I can fit up to six and I can fit, you know, almost a hundred skeins on this max. So I have enough room on here for everything I'm going to dry today. Once it's dry, then I will take photos of it uh, and then I will package it put labels on it, and then ship it out once it sells. So uh, the dyeing process really is only a small portion of the entire process. So the whole creativity portion <laughs> happens probably, you know, 10 to 15 percent of the time, and then the rest of the production is actually, you know, either prepping the skeins or cleaning pans, cleaning the kitchen, prepping, 
you know, all of the packaging, getting things packaged, shipped out. Uh, also, filming videos for you guys is also part of the process for me, which is very enjoyable. Uh, so I get a little bit more creativity time uh, in my week when I'm doing active videos. So I really hope that you guys enjoyed this video. If you have any questions for me, please do leave them in the comments section down below. Give this video a thumbs up if you did enjoy it. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about my dye process, and I'm happy to bring you along. And if it's something that you want to see again, then please let, also let me know in the comments section down below. So I will see you guys in my next video. I hope you have a great week. Uh, subscribe if you're not. If you'd like to see more videos like this, please do hit the notification bell when you subscribe so that every time I upload a new video, you'll get a notification because YouTube's great like that. So I will see you guys soon. Have a wonderful week and bye. Bye for now.